All right, we're a couple minutes away from Kevin starting, so I just want to make a couple introductory remarks. Um, and I have a couple of announcements, and I have a request. Um, welcome to our IEEE monthly meeting. We try to do these monthly, although we miss once in a while. We are planning to have a March meeting in a couple weeks, so watch for that notice. We have a distinguished lecturer coming in. Um, couple, uh, one other announcement I wanted to make was um, we are in the verge of having an election to either reelect existing officers or slate in a couple of new ones. In order to do that election, we have to have a ballot. We've got the ballot figured out, but we need a member, somebody that's not on the board, an IEEE member, to be a second person on that nominating committee. Very little work to do. We've already got the ballot figured out. We already have a primary person to do most of that work. But we need a second person, and it has to be a member of the section. So if you'd be willing to do that, please let me know. Um, and we could add you as a second person, and we could have that election here in the next week or two. But I need somebody to be that person. Um, that has to be a member. Second announcement is we had some requests tonight for PDH, Professional Development Hour Credit. We can do that. Um, there's a couple different ways. One is we can sign a copy of the meeting notice. If that suffices for you, if you need that, please let me know. We can do that. That's easy to, to do. If that doesn't suffice for whatever reason that you need, we can do a deeper credentialing type process with IEEE. We can do that. It's harder. It takes longer. So, But if you need that, we could do that as well. So please let me know um, if you are looking for those PDH professional development hours. My first preference would be to give you a signed copy, either via email or tonight, for um, this meeting notice, if that would suffice. So let me know if you need that. If you need to put in that request electronically, if you're watching online, Please send that to the secretary, Lena, um, you, who sent the meeting notice to you. She can do it, or you can send it to me. All right? With that, I think we'll introduce our speaker. So tonight, we're lucky we have a, one of my IBM colleagues. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer in an IEEE meeting, so we're glad to have him here. But the topic is finite element analysis, and we've had some requests from people to talk about FEA. FEA is a general numerical technique that a lot of numerical computational methods use. Kevin's going to talk about mechanical engineering applications of that, but a lot of our electromagnetic field solvers, for example, that we use at IBM are FEA-based as well. So it's a little more generalized than just that. But Kevin can talk to you about more of that. And so let me just introduce Kevin from his bio that he submitted, and then um, he can introduce himself further. So Kevin O'Connell from IBM, received his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering in 2010, and his master's degree in engineering mechanics in 2018 from Iowa State University in Ames. After completing his bachelor's degree, he joined IBM in 2010 as a mechanical engineer focused on finite element analysis and predictive engineering in IBM's Power Series server development team. He played a key role in transforming IBM's FEA capabilities and integrating finite element methods into the core design approach that has lowered IBM's development expense and reduced our test cycles. Kevin's role later expanded to include mechanical FEA work on IBM's Summit and Sierra supercomputers and room temperature and cryogenic FEA for IBM quantum computers that we're working on now. Mr. O'Connell has received several awards from IBM during his 13 years, including his master's black belt certification in hybrid Six Sigma methods. He is also an avid inventor with 35 patents and has received the IBM Master Inventor Award for the past seven years. So with that, please welcome Kevin O'Connell. Thank you. All right, thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so, yeah, we're going to be talking about finite element analysis today and uh, what that means and how we apply it. So, I'm going to start with a little bit of an introduction, just to talk about myself. Actually, I'm not going to add too much over that, but uh, I got some good pictures, so we'll start there. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what FEA is, um, and then from a kind of a theory and a math perspective, then we'll dive into some of the history on it, 
and then go into more about like why we care, what's its application, um, and then we'll dive a little bit into how do you use this in a product design cycle effectively. Uh, and then finally, I'll get a little bit back into, again, more on the FEA side, talk about some common simulation types, um, kind of like what Paul alluded to here. Uh, this numerical method has broad application in a lot of areas. Um, and then we'll dive into some more theory, keep talking about uh, element types that you'll encounter, and then the ever important piece of testing and validation your models to make sure that everything's accurate. Uh, and then we'll talk about some extensions of this technique into statistical modeling, and then um, finish up with uh, how you get started on your own and some tips and tricks. Uh, so again, just brief bio. Most of this Paul already mentioned, so I'm not gonna rehash, um, but I've been at IBM now for about 13 years uh, and have a wide range of actually multi-physics experience too, so primarily mechanical, but I have dabbled in electromagnetics and actually a little bit of optical and acoustics modeling as well. Um, and then, I am also an avid rock climber on the outside. Uh, that's what I enjoy doing. I'll spend a lot of my time on. Um, and if you couldn't guess, uh, I am the one with the beard in that picture. So, all right, what is FEA? So the core of what we do in FEA is we take a part and we're discretizing that into smaller pieces or what we call elements. Each one of these elements is represented by uh, a mathematical equation of some sort. We then take these individual element equations and we combine them into a global equation uh, that we can then solve. And so here, this is an example of what a uh, mechanical global equation looks like. We have our stiffness, displacement, and force components of that. Um, this format that you see, that form stays persistent, uh, whether you're talking electromagnetics, acoustics, uh, you just change what the base equations look like. You then solve this global equation um, and that allows you to predict what is happening at the global level on that part. So if we consider uh, a basic math example here, if you look at a beam in tension, uh, and let's say we've taken that beam, applied a force on one end and fixed it on the other, we then divided that into two elements, and with those two elements we have three nodes. Um, and each one of these elements is only working in a tensile direction, so we only have one degree of freedom in this system. Each one of those elements, like we talked about, is uh, controlled by a governing set of equations. Uh, and those are initially done in the local coordinate system for each element. We then translate that over to our global uh, matrix format. And we come up with uh, two different equations, one for each element in this global format. We then take these two equations, we combine that into our global equation, which is in the format that we just saw before and it looks like this. Um, so you'll see this has those same stiffness, um, displacement, and force components uh, to this equation. Um, and we're talking about a very simple problem here, so one degree of freedom, and already with two elements and one degree of freedom, we have a three by three matrix. Um, and for those of you who remember linear algebra and have tried to do any of this by hand before, uh, you can see that if you try to scale this up to practical problems, uh, this quickly becomes unsolvable by hand because every element you add, every node you add, and every degree of freedom you add increases the order of that matrix. Um, so when I'm running problems, my matrices are in the order of usually somewhere around like three and a half million. Uh, <laughs> so you gotta have uh, computer help for that. And that's where we talk about a little bit on the history of FEA. So the theory has actually been around for you know, 80 years. Back in the 40s, this was developed um, by a couple of folks, Alexander Renkoff and Richard Current. Um, and this continued to evolve over the years uh, until you saw some open source type codes starting to come out in the 60s and 70s. And that 60s and 70s kind of lines up with when computing really started to take off as well. Um, and that's important because, like we said, matrix math is compute and memory intensive. It's hard to do by hand and it's hard for a computer to do too. So you need a lot of computing power to be able to do this um, at a practical level. So we've seen really a surge in the last, I'll say, decade or two of this becoming far more practical as an application. And really that's, you know, computing power has gotten, we've kind of reached a threshold where the amount of computing power you need to run practical problems is now affordable to a lot of people and a lot of companies. Um, so we're seeing another surge uh, of FEA entering uh, really businesses kind of of all levels. 
So that's all great, but why do we care? Um, so in reality, the things that we develop, the products that we produce, like the real world is a harsh environment. Um, whether we're talking about shipping conditions and you know the USPS guy throwing your package out the back of a truck onto the ground, uh, whether we're talking about thermal cycling, say in, uh, in an in engine application in automotive, uh, or even user interaction, right? You know, somebody closes the latch and pushes it 10 times harder than they needed to to close it. Um, and then other environmental impacts, like uh, if you look at the medical industry, like pacemakers, the inside of the body is a, is a challenging environment as well. So Find It Element allows us to uh, visualize structures, how they bend and twist, uh, look at stresses and strains, uh, and really do it in ways that you can't effectively do with measurement techniques. Um, just have the example of a latch here on this slide that we, that we modeled. And there's no way with measurement techniques that you could really visualize this level of detail on a part. Um, some of it's just you can't measure it. Um, and to measure it to this um, fidelity is difficult as well. Um, it also allows us to take a part and look at a full range of tolerances. So it's difficult to build a part at the extremes of tolerances. Um, and uh, Finite Element allows us to look at that uh, very analytically. Um, and finally, uh, we can iterate, optimize, and improve a design before we ever, ever have to build parts, uh, and we can save a lot of money doing that. So from a business perspective, we care because it's um, lower product part and development cost. Um, it improves our sustainability and carbon footprint. Uh, it gives us a faster time to market and allows us to produce safer products. So at IBM, uh, we try to involve this process as early as we can in, the design pro in, in our design cycle. Uh, and really, that be is because the more concepts that we can uh, test and explore with finite element analysis, the better chance we have of hitting on the right design. Um, so if you're familiar with it, it's kind of this agile design methodology, right? Fail fast. Um, but we never have to build the parts. We want to fail quickly um, by using this modeling technique. Um, and so our model here, like with our mechanical simulation predictive engineering team, right, early and continuous involvement. We want to be there from the beginning this product is conceived um, all the way through when we do testing and validation on the part um, that we actually build. All right, um, back to a touch more theory here. Um, so I'm going to, as Paul alluded to, right, there's a lot of applications to this. I'm going to talk through a few different types of simulation that you might run into when you're kind of exploring this on your own. So the first up is what I'll call the boundary element method. Um, so this is a little different. Um, rather than meshing the entire part, we're meshing the skin of the part. And then we're using the behavior that we calculate at the skin to predict what's happening inside of the part. Um, this is great for certain types of problems. Uh, think large domain things like acoustics, electromagnetics, things like that. Um, things where our, our wavelengths or our, the distances we're trying to analyze are very large. Um, so for those types of problems, uh, it can be very good. However, it doesn't handle complex geometry very well. And the example I have on the screen here, uh, if we wanted to, let's say we had this and we wanted to know the electromagnetic radiation that's coming out of that box there. If we were to do this with a finite element method, we would have to, have to mesh the entire volume of that green box that you see there. Um, but if we use a boundary element method, we can mesh the skins of these parts, and we can uh, make this a lot more efficient. Uh, next up, and this is one that we use extensively within IBM. Uh, this is CFD, or computational fluid dynamics. Uh, this is actually a, almost a direct use of FEA, but it, it looks a little different. Um, so here we're using uh, thermal equations as well as some uh, mechanical equations as well. And what we're trying to do is predict fluid th flow in and around a body. Uh, you see this used a lot in automotive and aerospace industry to predict air streams and drag coefficients and lift and things like that. But we take that a step further at IBM and we actually couple that with thermal equations to understand the cooling power and the temperature that a components inside of our servers uh, and how they're going to behave. And you can see the example I've got here. Um, the blue streamlines that you see, that's the meshing of the fluid. So that's how the, the water, or, or air or water in this case, is flowing through the part. And then you can see the temperature gradients down at the layers on the bottom, uh, telling us how, that this fluid is, how much heat this fluid is taking away from our component. 
All right, um, now to get something that uh, I'm a little more directly involved with here, uh, there's a couple types of mechanical modeling too that I want to touch on uh, that you run into. Um, the first is uh, called what we call explicit modeling. This is great for short time domain type problems, um, highly transient things, and things with uh, lots of nonlinearity or um, complex contact. And when I say nonlinearity, uh, that means if you have permanent deformation of materials. So think of like a bullet ripping through a piece of sheet metal. Um, that's a great example of a, a kind of a standard nonlinear problem. So this type of method really excels where complex, or we have very complex and unpredictable uh, contact. Uh, this is the video you're seeing here. This is an, uh, directly taken from our 1080 uh, flagship power server. This is a shipping test we actually ran on this system. And you can see there's a lot of stuff going on in there. And it's, basically impossible for us to know what is going to contact each other within that um, system. So it's difficult to simulate, and that's where Explicit comes in and can help us monitor that uh, effectively. Uh, the way that it solves uh, the actual model is it takes very small time slivers and slowly and solves the equation at every one of those little time slivers. And it lets it kind of lets you see the full transient history and kind of allows it to creep up on the final solution for this. Uh, to give you an example, uh, the video that you're seeing there is in slow motion. That's roughly about 100 milliseconds of time. Uh, and you can see I have a little example of the solver code output at the bottom there. Uh, and you can see my time step is about uh, 9 e to the minus 8 seconds. So you can see that if I want to simulate this event, I have to solve that equation many, many, many times. Um, so that's why it's good for those short duration events. Uh, we use this in our servers all the time in our product design. Basically any IBM server that you purchase has been through this mechanical analysis technique at this point. Um, so I've, I'm showing a picture here. Uh, this is our flagship Power 1080 server. It's the same one that you saw going through that drop test in the last picture. Um, and so what this allows us to do is look at the behavior of our circuit boards, uh, other highly sensitive electronic components in there, uh, allows us to look at how our sheet metal is bending and deforming and whether it's going to break. Uh, and then it also lets us look at all the different pluggable interfaces that are in there, whether it's power supplies, memory modules, fans. We want to understand how those are interacting with the main system. And finally, we actually use it to explore multiple shipping scenarios too. Uh, so what you saw in that last picture was a rack mounted scenario and we do send, ship our products to customers fully integrated in a rack. Um, however, we do also offer those uh, packaged up um, safely in a foam box and, and send to our customers and we will model uh, both of those situations. All right, so on that sheet metal piece that I mentioned, uh, this is an example of part of what we use this for in our design. So what you're looking at is a bracket that goes onto the back of the system, uh, and it provides support to the system during a shock event like you saw, uh, and it also doubles as sort of a cable management arm to keep that kind of rat's nest of cables that you saw back there tamed <laughs> uh, and a little easier to manage. So you can see in the initial design that we had there, um, that we have quite a bit more of that red region showing up. And that red region is getting into a domain of uh, plastic stress on the plastic strain on the part uh, that we're uncomfortable with. Uh, so we made some changes to the design, um, both from a material perspective as well as some geometry changes, uh, and was able to pull that back down to a level that we were comfortable with. And you can see that in that final design that we've reduced uh, how much of those red regions were really showing up there and how much plastic strain that part is experiencing. Uh, and when we subsequently took that through test, uh, this bracket passed on the first go. So we were able to iterate, optimize, find the right design point and the most efficient design point uh, for this before we ever had to build a part. Probably the most important thing that we look at is the strain on our circuit boards. Um, this is, you're looking at uh, a picture of the strain on that Power 1080 motherboard. And this is really the heart of the system. It's what everything passes through. If you have a signal coming into the system, you have power coming into the system, all of it passes through this motherboard. And so it's essential that uh, this is robust and reliable. Um, and what FE allows us to do is again, do that before we build it, but also looking at strain with this level of fidelity, it's impossible to measure. 
Um, these are very dense boards, and so even getting instrumentation on there to be able to measure it is challenging enough, um, let alone actually getting strain gauges and things like that that are small enough. You could never actually measure um, this level of fidelity that you're seeing on the screen. So that allows us to go, and if we see high strain uh, and things that we're concerned about, uh, we'll actually change how we're supporting this in the system. Maybe we'll add some stiffeners, change materials. We might move bolt or rivet locations, um, or uh, do another a variety of other parameters we might adjust um, to bring this down to where we want it to. Uh, and again, our goal is to bring everything down below our risk level so that we get a first pass uh, success on test. Um, now we're going to talk about a little bit different uh, method. So that was the explicit method. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, implicit modeling. Uh, this is a little different. Now, rather than time, slowly time stepping through, uh, what implicit does is it tries to go to the very end state of your model, the steady state, uh, and then it tries to balance out the equation over there. Uh, and there are a number of uh, residual methods out there that are used, um, but most commonly uh, I see newton raphson methods used for this type of thing. Um, and a lot of the, the proprietary solver codes that are out there too have other tips and tricks kind of all baked around that. So, but they're all usually based on that newton raphson method. Uh, the advantage is that for longer time scale problems, this is much more efficient. Um, so you can see in the, the graph that I have in the upper right there, uh, that is looking about 90 millisecond time scale. And you can see that that system is really ringing, right? It's very slowly damping down. So if I want to know what that, the state that that system was going to be in at the very end when it's uh, in a steady state condition, I'd have to run that model in an explicit sense for probably another three to five times as long as I ran it. Uh, and if I remember right, that particular model for 90 milliseconds took about uh, 15 to 20 hours of runtime in order to reach that. So rather than an overnight solve, uh, you're looking at multiple days to a week of solve time just to get one result. Um, so like I said, much more efficient for long time scale problems. Uh, where you tend to see this uh, is on uh, like bolted assemblies uh, or in like pressure, constant pressure type vessels. Um, also, steady state thermal um, is used for this as well. Uh, and then even taking that a step further, very long-term behavior, uh, when we talk about material creep, if you have a latch or something that's loaded long-term, how is that part going to relax over time? And that's where uh, implicit really shines. I'll mention this here. It's probably a little more advanced than we need to go on, but there are now some codes that actually use a hybrid of explicit and implicit. Um, think about a latching scenario where the initial latching event is a very transient event with complex contact. Uh, you could run that using an explicit solver. And then it can actually transition from an explicit to an implicit solve. And then you can see um, maybe how that latch uh, relaxes over time. Um, and I'll, I will mention uh, again one more time, you know, all of these methods here, explicit, implicit, anything, they can all be done with different types of physics. Um, you just change those base constitutive equations that those elements are made up of, um, and you can apply this to a lot of different areas. All right, one of the main spots that we use this in in our systems is to look at uh, how our processors are going to behave. Um, so these are very complex, highly sensitive devices. They're also very expensive, so if they fail, um, it's bad for the customers, it's bad for us. Um, so we spend a great deal of time modeling these to make sure that they stay robust. Uh, in that Power 10 system that we saw that has four processors in it, each one of those uh, has about 400 pounds being pushed down through the middle of it. Um, and that, as you might guess, that drives a significant amount of force. Um, so if we look at kind of the load path here as we get into it, uh, you can see that blue arrow pointing down. So we have uh, a spring that pushes down through there. Uh, that load channel helps distribute the load into the heat sink, and then the heat sink uh, presses down through our thermal, thermal interface layer that helps us make, get heat out of the processor and into the heat sink. Uh, and then that force continues down through the module or, or the processor and then onto what we call the LGA or and the socket. And the LGA is, you can think of just basically a bed of springs. So there's uh, over 4,000 of these springs underneath every single one of those processors, and that's where it's a significant portion of that 400 pound um, requirement comes from. 
And then for those of you who have done mechanics, if you look at your force path, right, we got to come back through and finish our free body diagram. So if you come back down through the board, uh, we actually put a steel stiffener underneath our processors to make sure that we don't bend and warp the board and the processor too much. Uh, and that helps us translate that force back out um, to our load frame where we have our counter force. All right, um, and this is important because it will help us predict how this is behaving. Um, and again, there, once this is assembled, there are pieces within this processor that we cannot measure. It's, it's impossible to do that. Um, so FEA allows us to look at those uh, internal to the processor and actually understand the stresses and strains that are going on. And then we can compare that back to prior known good design points that we've also modeled, and we can get a confidence in our future designs uh, that this will be effective and that we have a good chance of passing during test. All right, uh, and then the last piece again, iteration, right? There's a lot of variables to play with here. Um, this lets us look at a wide range of things. I have a couple examples called out at the bottom there. Um, this BSM strains, so that's actually the bottom layer of the processor. Uh, on that last page, I'll jump back here real quick. Um, this is the bottom of the processor. And so this layer on the bottom, we want to make sure uh, doesn't get damaged um, because that's where there's a lot of signals coming in and out of there. Uh, and if that starts to crack, we get in trouble. So we want to make sure that our strain uh, is good to go. The other thing, uh, being that we have over 4,000 pins there, every single one of them is essential uh, to making sure that we have signals, reliable signals going in and out of the processor. Uh, and so we want to make sure that each one of them has enough force to make good contact with the bottom of the processor and maintain that through its lifetime. All right. Um, another great example of this uh, is kind of a plugging example. So think about uh, taking a USB cable and plugging it into the back of your phone. Seems like a short-term event, but when we're talking about solder and strain, uh, it is a relatively long-term event. So that's what I would call a quasi-static sort of application. Um, and so we want to make sure that we have a lot of pluggable interfaces in our system. We want to make sure that when we plug those, we don't cause problems. Um, and so we will apply the force to our motherboard or to our various boards in the system, and we'll look at both the deflection and the strain. Um, strain tells us damage, um, and deflection tells us whether we're going to hit any of the surrounding components or anything like that. And it also deflection is also key to just like um, quality feel. You know, if you plugged in your a cable into something and it moved around a whole bunch, it's not going to give you a good quality feel to it. So we want to make sure that we're not deflecting our cards too much when customers are interacting with them. All right, uh, back to a little bit of theory here. Um, so there's a few different element types that we end up working with. Uh, and again, these are fairly generic. You'll see these in many types of physics. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is a shell element. Um, so these are 2D elements. Uh, they have uh, four or eight nodes typically on them. Uh, and because it is a 2D element, we actually have, each node has to have six degrees of freedom defined. So if you remember back to our uh, initial equation, we had a single degree of freedom system. Now for every single one of those nodes, we have three translational and three rotational degrees of freedom. Um, so again, even in a simple single element uh, problem, our matrix is already quite large and pretty much unsolvable by hand. Um, so these are used for high aspect ratio parts. Uh, think of sheet metals, uh, or in our case, circuit boards we use this quite a bit for as well, uh, or other thin film types of applications. Uh, and it's a very efficient way because it uses um, essentially integration points through the thickness of that part to calculate and predict uh, what's happening, say, at the surface of the board or the bottom of the board, um, all while only having to mesh, say, the mid-layer on that. So a very efficient way to do those types of problems. Um, I mentioned that there's four and eight node versions of this. Uh, the additional nodes, uh, you can see down here, uh, give you a little more fidelity along the edge of a node, or edge of an element. If I wanted to get that same level of fidelity with the four node version, I would have to uh, quadruple the number of elements that I was going to use. Um, so it's a little more efficient in many cases to use these higher order elements. Uh, and you'll see that repeated here in a couple other element types that I talk about, too. All right, solid elements. Um, so 2D elements, great thin, uh, thin sorts of parts, sheet metal, circuit boards. Uh, when you have more complex geometry, when you have true solid parts, uh, that's where 3D elements come into play. 
Um, and because they are 3D, um, you actually only need three degrees of freedom at each node. Uh, the rotational aspect is taken care of just by the nodal positions relative to each other. So it's just kind of inherent uh, in the way that's managed. Uh, there's two primary types that uh, you know I typically see and will use. Um, the first is this hex element, uh, kind of like a cube, eight corners. Um, and it's good for, it, it's, if you can use them, it's a very efficient way to um, mesh solid parts. Uh, the trouble is it can be a little bit difficult to meet shape criteria. And I'll touch on that here in a moment. Uh, the second type is this tetrahedral element. Uh, so this has um, five corners on it. Uh, and it's better for complex geometry. You can use them to conform to uh, yeah, more complex shapes and parts uh, where you might not be able to do that with a hex element. Uh, the downside is that you need more tetrahedral elements to cover the same amount of space as a hex element. So when you can do it, hex is better um, than the tetrahedral. I mentioned a little bit about uh, shape criteria. So all of these elements want to be in their most stable form, which is, um, in the case of like a hex element, it's going to be a cube. In the case of a tetrahedral element, you want you know, even angles everywhere. Um, and the closer you are to that shape, the more stable your model is going to be and the more accurate your model is going to be. If your elements start to get too far away, you introduce numerical instabilities when you're trying to solve these problems. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, I've had elements that have turned completely inside out during a solve um, just because they, my, just because I didn't have good shape on them to begin with. Um, so meeting that shape criteria is really important. Um, the good news, you generally don't have to worry about it. If you're using modern finite element code, all of the meshing algorithms that they have in there have sh shape criteria checking built into them. So you're generally going to get a pretty good mesh unless you kind of force it to do something it doesn't want to. All right. Um, the last type of element here that I wanted to touch on, uh, this is a beam element. Um, and this is probably, I'll say, the original element. Um, it is the most simple uh, when you have, you know, nothing but punch cards um, and a basic mechanical computer. This is something that's easy to run uh, and can be used for a variety of problems. Um, because it is this uh, limited shaped element, we're not talking about a 3D element anymore, uh, we do need six degrees of freedom again. So every node is going to have those three translational and three rotational degrees of freedom. It predicts the, the strength and behavior of this um, utilizing, um, I'll say, standard beam equations. So in addition to calculating what's happening at the nodes, along the length of that, it's also using a, cr a, cr a cross section that you define for that beam. So that could be anything from like an I-beam. Um, it could be a cylinder, it could be a square, it could be a T-shape. As long as it's continuous along the length of that beam, uh, you can use that cross-section. So it's very efficient um, for modeling certain types of things like beam trusses um, or bolts or, um, yeah, or wires, right? And at IBM, we use these for modeling um, rivets and bolts primarily. Uh, you look at that model that I had or the, the example of that system, um, there are hundreds to thousands of rivets and screws inside of that. And I need to model all of those um, to have an accurate model in my case. And if I can simplify those down to these beams, um, that saves me a significant amount of computation time. Um, and it's essential for us to, uh, to get good results in a reasonable amount of time. Um, just like the others, uh, this does have higher order as well. Um, so I've shown an example of a three beam element down here. And again, that just gives you better prediction and calculations across the entire span. Um. All right. So kind of a little element example here. Um, this is a compound latch that we designed, again, for that 1080 power system. Uh, and you can see I've got uh, those thin flat sheets there in the kind of the brown and the gray. Uh, those are sheet metal. So those are great use for those shell elements. And you can see that I've uh, meshed them with that in this particular model. Meanwhile, I have that green body, which is, kind of, I'll say, the catch for the latch. Um, it's the part that you're pushing on with your hand. That's much more complex geometry, and it's a 3D part. Um, and so here, I chose to mesh that with uh, tetrahedral elements uh, to give me the best uh, fidelity and most accurate model. Uh, and I will say, you'll notice here that I've combined different types of elements in the same model. 
Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, as long as it can be uh, mathematically modeled, right, you can use that together in the same, same model. Uh, and to some extent, particularly on like 3D parts, you can even use the same or different element types within the same body. So sometimes we'll combine both hex and tetrahedra elements um, to have the most efficient mesh throughout the body of a part. So Kevin, yeah. does, does the software figure that out on its own, or do you kind of have to give it hints on how to do that? Yeah, um, the software is pretty good at doing it on its own. Um, it doesn't always give you the most efficient mesh. It will mesh it for you and give you usually a good answer. Um, but sometimes, especially on the larger models that we work with, we want to play with that a little bit more and try to bring that element count down. Otherwise, it kind of becomes untenable for the larger stuff. Um, but if you're using some of the more, if you're doing simple parts and you're using some of the more automated tools, generally they just mesh everything with tetrahedrals and call it good. Um, there's, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. All right, uh, looking at what this produced for us. Um, so this is a bit of an interesting scenario because we wanted, we had a relatively high force requirement at the very beginning of plugging this particular assembly. Um, and if you were to try to model that with, uh, or if you were to try to do that with a, just a single spring, uh, you'd have to have a very steep slope on that spring. And that means at the high end of your tolerance, um, you'd just be off the charts and you'd be breaking everything. So by designing a compound latch like this, we're able to have this apparent kind of like non-zero start that you see down on the left side of the graph. And then we're able to flatten that curve um, so that as we increase the load, uh, we don't increase as steeply as if we were doing this with a single spring. And as you can see in that geometry, there's a lot of angles, a lot of radiuses, a lot of lengths that we could play with in there. So a lot of different parameters to analyze to make sure that we came up with the optimum design. Um, and using our modeling tools, we were able to look at all of that stuff and come up with uh, an appropriate design for our application here. Uh, and actually, this worked great, too. We were very happy with this, uh, and we actually uh, got a patent on this design as well. So pretty happy with the outcome. All right, next up, the ever important piece of model validation. Um, so your models are only as good as your inputs. Uh, and our inputs inevitably have to come from some amount of observation of the real world. Um, when you're early on in the design phase, if you don't have prior experience with some of these materials, you have to make educated guesses, look at material data sheets, um, think through your physics problems. Um, it's where hand calculations can become valuable too. Um, kind of helps you set up the problem um, and get you going in the right direction. But inevitably, once you build that, you need to validate that. Um, and so we have a variety of techniques out there um, I'm going to talk a few that we use, um, but this is certainly not an exhaustive list because we've been trying to measure stuff for hundreds of thousands of years, so um, <laughs> this stuff is not necessarily new. Uh, one of the main ways that we use it, uh, we try to validate our models, is uh, with these strain gauges, um, and I'll touch on more detail on that in a moment. Um, and the second way that we use is uh, these accelerometers. Um, so accelerometers directly measure the acceleration that a part is experiencing. Um, they're pretty easy to set up and use, um, but have some challenges too that uh, I'll hint on in, in another slide. Uh, and then the last one is actually direct measurement of displacement. Uh, there's a variety of techniques out there. Um, the ones that I'm listing are particularly well suited for uh, dynamic environments. I mean, you saw the shock event that that server was going through. So that's a lot of what we're interested in. Um, so I just listed out a few, and we do use these all in various capacities at IBM. Um, you can measure with uh, bouncing a laser off of the part. It's a great non-contact method. Uh, you can also use uh, capacitance sensors to actually measure displacement changes. Um, also a non-contact method that's pretty powerful. Um, and then the last one, and I have a picture of this here. This is an LVDT. Um, so it actually uses, um, it, it measures capacitance and change as that little plunger. Uh, moves with the part, and then it can translate that directly to a displacement. So with strain gauges, um, this is one of our favorite methods. Uh, they're relatively unobtrusive. Um, they're relatively small. Um, so we can take these and we can um, adhere them directly to uh, our motherboards. And then we can measure that in test, and then measure that in the same spot in our model, which you can see in the middle picture there. And that allows me to directly compare uh, between those. And you can see in this uh, particular example here, 
uh, we got pretty good agreement. Um, we're right within the range there. Um, and considering the number of variables uh, that are in one of these systems, even just from a test input perspective, uh, usually we're within about five to 10% and we're pretty happy with that. Um, strain gauges are also particularly interesting and this touches a little bit back on some of the theory as well. Um, so fine element analysis inherently is calculating displacements. Um, that's what it does. And strain is defined as a change in length over length. And so that is a direct translation from a displacement into a strain measurement, which means that there's no extra noise that we're introducing into our comparison between our model and our test. If you compare that to, say, an accelerometer, um, acceleration is the second derivative of um, displacement. So every time you take a derivative, uh, when you have a numerical simulation, you end up introducing numerical noise into your output, um, which makes it challenging to compare directly between our model uh, and our test environment. There are some techniques and things out there that allow you to do that and eliminate some of the noise, um, but they're a little challenging to implement uh, and they take some uh, figuring and filtering uh, to do well. And we, we do use that, um, but our primary method is, is through strain gauges. All right, um, so now I want to touch a little bit, uh, how do we extend this on? Um, so one of the great things about uh, finite element analysis and these numerical techniques is that they are deterministic. If I run the same model 10 times, I will get the same output 10 times. Fantastic, it's really good for comparing um, design ideas and knowing that I'm not getting extra, any extra variation or unexpected noise in there. Um, but the problem with FEA is that it's deterministic and deterministic is inherently not reality. Um, the world we live in is very much a probabilistic and stochastic based world. Um, so how do we take our finite element models and bring them closer to reality? Um, and so we can couple our models uh, with a number of statistical design methods. Uh, and the one I'm showing here that uh, I use quite a bit is this um, kind of central composite design approach. Uh, and so here we'll take the ranges of our tolerances uh, within the part that we're aware of, uh, or maybe ranges of our, our known inputs for our test. We'll feed that into a number of different models. Um, and so I'll run one model for each of the corner cases, and then I'll run an additional model for each of those star points that you see on there. And then I'll run an additional one for kind of that center case. And if I put that all together, um, I can fairly accurately represent what's happening inside of that box and within the design space that I'm interested in. Um, and that's particularly powerful because we can also do some interesting things with um, reduced order modeling at that point too and actually allow us to more efficiently explore the entire design space. We do have to be a little bit careful with this method, however, uh, because if you pick up too many variables, uh, that design space can get quite large uh, and you might have to run hundreds of models in order to actually accurately predict how all those, all those variables are going to interact. All right, a little example of how I used this uh, somewhat recently. So what you're looking at here is essentially the top of one of those processors that I was showing before. Uh, and when we're doing a service action on the system, we want to make sure that that processor uh, stays in place throughout that so we don't knock it. Because if we damage any one of those little 4,000 pins, uh, we risk bringing a system down, um, you know, causing a short. Uh, there's a whole list of bad things that can happen. So we want to make sure that that stays in put. And so we designed up this uh, wire hold down bail. Um, and so this goes over the module and it applies a force down to keep that module in place uh, during that service action. However, we need to design this such that it has enough force and it has not too much force and not too little force. Um, so that's where some of these uh, methods can come into play. Uh, there were two primary variables that I was looking at here, and you can see that in the bottom. I've got that lead-in diameter, and then I've got the offset. So I wanted to look at um, basically an infinite combination of those to uh, uh, land on the most appropriate uh, design. And once I ran, uh, I used that central composite design approach, picked all my, ver my parameters, ran a bunch of different models, and was able to generate this uh, response surface. So this is essentially the output of a reduced order model. What it allows me to do is look at the two variables on the X and Y 
and compare that and see how they influence uh, my force response on the Z. Uh, so looking at this, uh, I should also note that all of those little black dots on there that you see, those are the design points that I ran and those fed into the algorithms to produce this, this response surface. So if you look at what we learn out of this particular one, uh, along that uh, Y axis, which is kind of on the right there, uh, we can see that we're relatively insensitive uh, to that lead-in radius. That, that curve is pretty flat, so we know that we're not having a huge influence there. Um, and instead, we're dominated by that offset, which is on the X axis, and you can see that as that increases, uh, our force tracks along with it. And what that allowed us to do is understand exactly what's going on there and then pick the most optimum design point. Um, and from a uh, design robustness standpoint too, it also gives us confidence that we are relatively insensitive to some of these variables. So we could potentially open up tolerances if we needed to for the manufacturer in one of these uh, spots, knowing that we're not gonna drift too far off of our design targets. All right, so how do you do this? A um, few tips and tricks on getting started. Um, pretty much no matter what you're doing, any physics you're employing, you're gonna follow, I'll say this general workflow. Uh, first off, you need some sort of part or geometry, whether you've designed that yourself, whether you've downloaded it from a website, whether uh, you know, another engineer has designed it up for you. You need to get that 3D CAD and bring it into your software or draw it up in the software yourself. After you've done that, assign material properties to it. Um, that's essential. Uh, whether it's made out of steel or plastic are gonna have very different responses, so you wanna make sure you pick the right materials. Uh, then define your boundary conditions, uh, and I'll touch on that again here in a moment. Uh, and then define contact. Uh, and this is really only if you have multiple parts, so you wanna know if they're sticking, sliding, gonna be separable, um, a lot of different ways they can interact. Uh, and then you mesh it with the elements that we previously talked about run that through the solver code, uh, review those results, uh, and then validate with test. Um, and, those, and this is a workflow that you will probably run through multiple times in a single design. You know, you're gonna iterate through reviewing those results, making changes, resetting up your model, and running through to find that point. Um, and then likewise, once you get test results, you may go back and revisit if they don't agree with your model uh, and make some additional changes. The biggest mistake that I see people make, um, these software packages that you can use, uh, they're great at giving you pretty pictures. Um, they will give you an answer pretty much no matter what. Uh, but that can be very, very wrong. Um, so it's always worth spending the extra time to really think through your problem, to talk to people um, who are close to the environment that it's gonna be in, and make sure that you set up your boundary conditions and material assumptions in the most appropriate way possible. Because if you get any one of those wrong, even just a little bit, it can have dramatic influences on what you get out, uh, and it can lead you down some very poor directions in terms of your, what you might be trying to design. Um, so at best, you're wasting time. Uh, at worst, you're costing your company millions of dollars, or you know, maybe you're seeing field failures or even hurting someone, right, if it's a safety type of thing. So always pay attention to those boundary conditions. All right, in addition to that, uh, you need a computing resource. Um, on simple models, now you can pretty much run them on a laptop. Uh, there's, you know, they're pretty powerful the way they are now. But if you have more complex models, uh, like what you're seeing on a lot of my examples here, uh, there you need like dedicated simulation workstations. Um, and these are high core, high memory systems um, that you can dedicate those resources to. And then if you're taking it a step further, um, you can even go into a cloud environment. Um, most of the FEA packages out there uh, have both options for on-premise, so if you want to run that on a local cloud, and a lot of them even offer their own hosted environments too, so you can log on to their public cloud, submit a job out there, and get results. So a lot of options in, in today's market. Um, you're gonna need some sort of software tool. There's lots out there. Um, if you're already familiar with uh, like a CAD package like Creo or SolidWorks, uh, there are finite element tools now built into a lot of those as well. Um, and for basic types of solves, they're, they're quite powerful and, and perfectly adequate. Um, if you want to do more advanced things, have a little bit more control, you need to go to some more dedicated commercial type applications. Uh, at IBM, we use a lot of ANSYS. Um, that's across physics, too. Um, they have a whole full suite. Um, but we also do a use abacus, uh, and then just to name other few, like NASTRAN and two. So there's, there's lots of options out there. 
Um, and most of these do have some form of education licensing available too if you're trying to explore it um, and you're associated with the university or something like that. There's some good options out there. Um, like I said, material option or property, is, this is essential. Um, whether you're getting that from uh, data sheets, from online resources, from actual testing that you've done of materials, uh, all of that is adequate. Um, a lot of these commercial packages also have built-in material libraries, and those can be good for basic type things, but it's always important to look at those uh, properties that they're applying and make sure that they are representative of what you're actually building these parts from. Uh, and then one last piece too, obviously education, learning how to use this stuff. Um, all the major tools have great packages out, or great resources out there for teaching you, training classes, uh, all sorts of things. Um, but then to be honest, I mean with YouTube and the internet, you can learn a whole lot without ever having to pay for that stuff. Um, I know Ansys in particular even posts some of their own official corporate content out on YouTube. So yeah, there's a lot of great resources uh, right now to go do that. Um, and then to finish up too, um, so IBM, our predictive engineering group, uh, we are experienced in a wide range of things, um, you know, from statistical uh, Six Sigma type things to looking at earthquake analysis um, or even package things and, and dabbling in some CFD and fluid flow through various uh, membranes and airflows. Um, we've looked at EMC modeling and acoustics. Uh, and like I said before, I even have some experience in the optical uh, side of things. Uh, so we have a wide range of experience uh, within our team uh, and a lot of skills that we apply uh, on the daily uh, to all the problems that we as IBM face. Uh, and I should mention too that these are also available uh, through our engineering services group at IBM. So we, um, we can partner with people, we are available for hire uh, and we're as part of our broader engineering services thing. So. Uh, and it's not just my little predictive engineering group too. Uh, we also bring in folks, uh, I believe folks from like Paul's group and electromagnetics, uh, thermal. We have a very experienced thermal team as well. So there's a lot of resources that we can bring uh, to help you solve your problems as well. Um, and uh, even beyond that too, we have great program management type things too, full suite of services from project design, mechanical engineering, all the way through product testing and validation. Uh, and we have experience uh, in a wide range of things, uh, obviously servers and storage, because that's what I've been showing you here today, uh, but I mean, in supercomputing with our Summit Sierra, we have, IBM has a long history in supercomputing. Uh, we have done industrial applications uh, and even partnered, I believe, with Mayo in the past on some medical devices too, so we have some experience in the medical industry. Uh, and then uh, we have a steady cadence of things with the government and military as well, so. That's what I got. Uh, I'll open it up to questions then. Could you, can I cut you off? That was quite loud. Hang on. Let's just try to get the questions on the mic so that people online can hear. Well, my, my first question is, uh, do you charge for dumb questions? <laughs> no, me not personally. My time is... <laughs> okay. Um, on one of your very first slides, you showed a variable called K that was a stiffness mm -hmm. that you multiplied onto your various arrays there. Does that depend on linearity? Is that, sorry, you you have to that? stay below the elastic limit to make that number a constant? Uh, no, you don't. Um, that K can actually be variable, um, and we do actually do include a fair amount of nonlinear, nonlinear in our parts. So, for instance, like our sheet metal, there's the elastic region, like you talked about, and then after a certain point, it'll go into that that plastic region. Um, we can include that, and that K can actually vary throughout the life or throughout the simulation. So you adjust the value of K as the simulation progresses. Yeah, exactly. Um, in explicit, right, it'll kind of pick that up as it steps through that time step. Uh, yeah. In implicit, you end up kind of iterating on that solve uh, as it figures out that it's no longer in the elastic region and then it has to kind of switch where it is on the material curve. Um, okay, some years ago, and you alluded to using it for thermal analysis. Uh, some years ago, Cray had a machine that was, it, we, I don't know what the right name for it was, but everybody called it bubbles. And what it was is a machine that ran under floor inert, and 
it was used to, uh, the Florina was how it cooled, and of course, as soon as you generate a bubble, the thermal thing goes nonlinear on you. Is, is that something that you're, you'd be able to model? Uh, cavitation like that, I, I'll admit I am not a thermal expert. Um, my office mate would actually love to answer this question for you in great detail, but uh, I believe it can be solved. When you get into those types of problems, it gets very complicated. I know that type of stuff is, is still on the cutting edge of, of simulation. All right, well, I didn't expect to get an answer anyway, but I, <laughs> I, th I thought I'd try it. I have actually had those conversations <laughs> with some of our thermal engineers, so I know like this much about it, but yeah, it's, it's okay. a very interesting problem. Next one is back in your explicit model thing. You had a, you showed a picture of a board. Yeah. And it showed that board was uh, under uh, excitation, but I couldn't figure out what was the excitation. Yeah, so that excitation was actually that drop test that we saw in the video earlier. So, but is there a direction associated with the applied force? Yeah, it would, in this picture it would be uh, in and out of the screen. So, so if I go back to, to this picture here, that motherboard is underneath all of the components that you see and it lays flat. Okay, so we're doing a straight down drop. Yeah, that's correct. So what happens if we land on one corner? Uh, we model that as well, I just didn't show that one. Okay. Um, the, stress, the strain fields look a little uh, different. Uh, they'll tend to radiate out from that corner. Um, so you might see a little less strain in the opposing, or let me go here, yeah. You might see a little less strain in the opposing corner or something like that um, compared to where the drop was occurring. Okay. Um, believe it or not, we worked on a contact pressure module mount some years ago. And uh, one of the questions I have for you, you said that the criteria for a good uh, connection was uniform pressure under each of the 4,000 uh, connections under the module. Do you have a, a do you electrically model the, the signal propagation through the thing as it goes down from the chip down through the wiring on the module down through the connector down into the board yet, create distributed models that, that analyze that? Uh, in this particular situation, no, this is just a mechanical model, so we're not doing that simultaneously with this model. Yeah. Um, but the electrical team does look at things like that. They do that. Um, yeah, and the contacts themselves, when we work with the manufacturers on it, uh, they do a lot of that modeling as well and will tell us how much essential force we need on there to get the optimal um, electrical and impedance pathway through there. Okay. So uh, if you want to talk about picoseconds and, and uh, bandwidth, what would you tell me? How good is it? Hmm? Many gigahertz. Many gigahertz. Okay. That's um, when you put these things together, what, what is the largest matrix size that you generate? You talked um, about being in the cloud, but can you get a number? Yeah, so uh, we run a range of things. The most, the biggest I've seen recently uh, is probably about uh, three and a half million square. Okay. So. Yeah, that eats up a lot of memory. Uh, yeah, they, they do. Um, and depending, I should mention this, I didn't in here, but uh, explicit is actually more efficient usually in terms of memory usage than an implicit model too. Um, just in terms of how it has to hold the matrix in, mem in memory and manipulate it and everything like that too. So um, implicit can be a little bit more of a memory hog for, for those types of things. Toward the end of your pitch, you talked about you have to look at these things and see is this a sensible thing that's, that's being modeled here and the results within the realm of believability? Mm -hmm. that, that's interesting because there's a lot of that going on in artificial intelligence also. That yeah. If you look at it, you can get things that come out that are just total garbage and, and uh, yet it requires that overview to understand when are you way out in the left field someplace. And how do you develop that? in terms of ours. Um, so some of that is the testing that I talked about. Uh, in some cases, we can apply theoretical hand calculations to tell us if we're in the ballpark. 
Um, that's also another tool that we leverage. Because um, a lot of these are, you know, you can kind of break, break them down into beam bending equations and things like that. So you can get rough ideas on what you should be doing. Uh, the other piece I'll say is experience. Um, I know when I've hired new people into our team doing finite element, um, and I've talked to a number of them, generally you feel like you sort of know what's going on after about a year or two, and you feel like you're good at your job at about five years. Um, and a lot of that comes from just doing a lot of models and seeing how it turns out. And there's only so much that, you know, as a senior engineer, you can communicate that directly to them. So there's, there's definitely an experience and an art form that comes along with it, too. Um, and personally, my philosophy is when I look at a model, my first assumption is that it's wrong. And then I justify it to myself through some of these other things and experience things like that, then convince myself. Because if I can't convince myself that it's right, I'm not going to be able to convince the rest of my design team and my leaders and management that uh, this is reasonable. <laughs> Good answer. Um, one of the last thing I'd, I'd like to comment on is a, as an IBMer that worked there for 30 years and has been out for some while after that, one of the wonderful things on your slides was the one that showed garbage in, garbage out. We're, we are, uh, it, it's a time proven principle. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, nobody else has one right away. I had one. Um, when looking at the pressure on the CPU mount, do you do simulations where you model how the pressure changes as the components heat and cool? We do look at that, yeah. Um, so that's a really good point on one that I did not bring up. Um, so once these are clamped in place, um, these processors heat up, right? They generate heat when we put power through them, and they will change temperature. Uh, over time. Um, and so, yeah, we, we do run that uh, at extremes of temperature and look how that's going to behave. Um, because even when they're not running, uh, we still have to send them uh, out in a shipping environment. You know, and that might be in an airplane or something like that. And, and you know, and not in Minnesota, I mean, stuff can hit negative 20 just if it's January. Exactly, yeah. Other questions? All right, yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.